Hi everyone, my name is Mr. Tate and I'm an AP Computer Science teacher from Florida, back with part two of my five-part video series intended to walk you through the AP Computer Science Principles Create task and show you how to easily submit a project that receives full credit. If you haven't seen part one yet, click on the card or check out the link down in the description. As I mentioned in part one, you don't want to overplan because row three on the rubric requires you to discuss difficulties and opportunities that you encountered in your process. But here are some general tips for planning your project. Number one, there is no minimum requirement for the number of screens or lines of code. Making a bigger, longer program won't increase your score, and it may actually make it more difficult for you to complete your responses later on. Number two, at least one aspect of your program should involve math to satisfy row five on the rubric. This could be as simple as keeping track of a score by adding different point values to a total, or more complex like converting units or calculating a tip based on quality of service. College Board defines math as an expression that uses arithmetic operators, so something as simple as score equals score plus amount would qualify. Number three, you'll need to create an abstraction for row seven. An easy way to make sure that you correctly complete this task is to create a function that uses a parameter, which is a variable that you're going to pass into your function each time you use it. College Board does recognize other types of abstractions, such as application program interfaces, which are APIs, and libraries, but it's important to understand that you would need to create your own library or API, and using an existing library or API call does not qualify. I believe that library and API creation is well outside the scope of this course, so focus on procedures and parameters in your code. I always encourage my students to challenge themselves and make programs that are interesting to them. But apps have a way of getting very complex very fast. And the most important thing for you is to plan an app that you will be successful in completing. A good way to evaluate the complexity and feasibility of your app is to use note cards to show each screen of your app. Then, on a separate sheet of paper, write down how the user will interact with each design element and which elements will need to change based on those interactions. Using this preliminary design technique, you can usually spot potential issues and rein in the scope of your project to an achievable level. For this tutorial, I'm going to create a very simple one-screen app that accepts units of volume and converts them into other units of volume. I can satisfy the algorithm requirement by using a mathematical equation to convert from one unit to another, and I can create abstractions for each of the conversions, such as liters to gallons. My screen will need to have a text input box and a drop-down box containing different volume units. The bottom of the screen will contain the converted values in text areas with labels for their unit type. To interact with this program, users will type in a number value and then select a starting unit. Thinking forward to my code, this design would need event handlers to monitor both the number input and unit dropdown for any change. The downside of this method is that converted values at the bottom are going to update in real time as the user types in their value. To reduce complexity of my code and decrease the number of event handlers required, and also increase the user experience, I'm going to add one additional button called Calculate that will trigger the calculations instead of relying on event handlers for the text input and dropdown box. This is a perfect example of a design decision that I could write about in my reflection for part 2b, row 3 on the rubric, so I'll make a note of it for when I write my responses. Remember, we really don't want to over plan at this point, so it's time to start writing some code. That's going to be part 3 of this video series. I'm going to release a new part of the series every 3 days, so subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when the next part is released. Feel free to ask questions down in the comment section, and I hope this video was helpful. Happy coding, everyone!